Stand by. This is a one minute warning. Stand by. Good afternoon. I will invite Dr. Shah to give his daily briefing in just a few minutes. But first, as you all know now, earlier today, an explosion rocked the Androscoggin Mill in the town of Jay in Franklin County, sending plumes of smoke and debris into the air. The fire marshal's office, in conjunction with local officials, uh, will be investigating the cause of that explosion in the coming weeks. But for now, I am grateful to report that all employees and contractors have been fully accounted for and there were no serious injuries. And we are all in the state of Maine breathing a deep sigh of relief. I am also grateful for the emergency responders who, f who rushed to the scene and not knowing exactly what they would find, but as always, prepared with courage and the conviction of duty to do whatever was necessary to help. We've been through that before. To the workers of the Androscoggin Mill, you went to work today as you do every day, prepared to work hard to earn your livelihood and provide for your families. I am grateful beyond words that you are all okay. And please know that we stand with you during this difficult time that we support you. We don't know yet what the future may bring for the Androscoggin Mill. That'll come more fully into view in the coming days. But here's what I do know. Last year, last September, the town of Farmington and the state of Maine suffered an explosion that took the life of one of our best, Captain Michael Bell. Last Friday night, Larry Lord, the hero who saved countless people in that explosion, returned home to continue his recuperation. Since then, we've experienced a snowstorm, a windstorm, rain and widespread power outages, flood warnings, and now an explosion. This on top of a global pandemic. There's a common saying that God will not give you more than you can carry. Without question, the burden for us now is heavy, but Maine people can carry it, and we will carry it. I just want to say, if ever there is a day when we should believe in miracles, today is it. When I spoke a few minutes ago with the vice president of Pixel Company who owns the mill, the man who was the mill manager for five years, what he said was, God was with everybody today. I couldn't agree more. In these difficult moments, let us summon the strength, the courage and resilience which has defined us as Maine people throughout our history. 
and the things that have sustained us through our most challenging times and continue to sustain us now. Today, let's be grateful that this explosion did not take any lives, and tomorrow we'll be ready to meet whatever challenges may come with open eyes, steady hands, and hopeful hearts. And now I would like to turn over, turn this over to Dr. Shah for his daily report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Mills. Good evening, everyone. My briefing this evening begins on a sad note and with a heavy heart. In addition to the events that Governor Mills described today, Maine CDC is also reporting an additional four individuals with COVID-19 who passed away. One was a male in his 80s from Androscoggin County. Another, a woman in her 70s from Cumberland County. The third, a man also in his 70s from Cumberland County. And the fourth, again, a man in his 70s also from Cumberland County. We, all of us at the state of Maine, offer our condolences to the families of those four individuals who have passed during this time of their grieving. Maine CDC is also reporting a total of 770 cases of COVID-19 across the state. That's an increase of 36 cases since yesterday. At present, 126 individuals have been hospitalized at some, court, at some time during the course of their COVID-19 illness. That's an increase in, of two from yesterday. Right now, there are 26 individuals across the state who are hospitalized for COVID-19 in regular hospital beds, and an additional 22 individuals who are unfortunately in intensive care right now. That's a total of 48 individuals who right now in Maine are hospitalized because of COVID-19. That's a drop of 10 since yesterday. Of those 48, nine of them remain on ventilators, and that's the same number as yesterday. As I mentioned a moment ago, we're recording an additional, unfortunately, four individuals who have passed with COVID-19, bringing our statewide total of individuals who have passed to 24. Overall, 305 Maine people have recovered with COVID-19, an increase of 13 since yesterday. And since Maine CDC began its activation, 14,076 individuals have tested negative for COVID-19. Of all of those who have tested positive, 166 are healthcare workers. That's a total of about 21% of all of our positive cases accounted for by healthcare workers. And I would just like to take a moment to thank, as Governor Mills did, all of those healthcare workers, first responders, individuals who work in hospitals, individuals who work in long-term care facilities, for their selfless, quiet, powerful acts of heroism, going to work as they do every day to keep Maine people healthy. I'd like to turn next to provide an update on some of the outbreaks that we are tracking in long-term care facilities across the state. But before I do, let me preface some of these numbers by noting that long-term care facilities have been and continued to be one of our highest areas of focus since we began our work around coronavirus many months ago. Months ago when we started, we began working with long-term care facilities on education. We then quickly shifted to preparedness, and now we are in the response phase. One of the central planks of our response is that we don't wait for cases to come to us. Our posture is to be aggressive and actively look for the cases, especially because in long-term care facilities, we know they are our highest populations of risk. And that's why we're seeing more cases. One of the mantras of public health is that when you look for things, you find them. 
And in this situation, our team has gone out aggressively, proactively to look for more cases. And as a result of that, when you look for things, we find them. And that's what we're seeing now. At the Maine Veterans Home in Scarborough, there are a total of 38 individuals, both residents and staff, who have tested positive for coronavirus. And that's the same number as it was yesterday. Sadly, at Maine Vets, there have been two individuals who have passed away. At the Augusta Rehab Facility, there are a total of 69 individuals, again, both residents and staff, who have tested positive for a coronavirus. And sadly there, there have also been two individuals who have passed. At the Tall Pines facility in Waldo County, there have been a total of 25 individuals, again, both residents and staff, who have tested positive for coronavirus, and that's an increase of one since yesterday. And yesterday, Maine CDC was made aware of conditions at the Cedars facility in Portland that constitute an outbreak. And we are now aware of a total of five cases there, three cases in residence and five cases, I'm sorry, three cases in residence and two cases among staff members. As with all of these situations, one of our central focuses right now is on long-term care because we know the residents who live there, the people who call those facilities their homes, our parents, our spouses, our siblings, are vulnerable for, to coronavirus. And as a result, Maine CDC, all of us at the state of Maine, are keeping these facilities top of mind right now. And one of the ways we are doing that is by actively and aggressively doing more searching for cases so that we can take all the protective measures that need to be implemented to keep everyone safe. I'd like really quickly now to just provide a quick update on where we are with respect to our shipments and deliveries of personal protective equipment across the state. Yesterday, there were 30 orders that were pulled, packed, and shipped and delivered to institutions across the state. All told, Maine CDC, working with our colleagues at the Department of Transportation, delivered nearly 18,000 pieces of PPE to facilities statewide yesterday. As I mentioned, our focus right now is on long-term care facilities, given the vulnerability of the individuals that we know to live there. But we are also continuing to make deliveries to your friends and neighbors. Local fire, EMS, law enforcement agencies are also continuing to receive PPE as we move through this outbreak. All told, since Maine CDC began its deliveries of PPE, 923 orders have been filled, and we continue to fill orders for PPE as those demands and as those requests come in. And finally, I would just like to note the receipt of one order of PPE that we received yesterday, which was 140,000 N95 masks we received from FEMA just yesterday. Those are being added to our inventory and will soon be shipped out as more requests for N95 masks come in. We, all of us, are continuing our search and our effort to procure additional PPE, both from private market sources as well as to produce PPE here in the state of Maine for the state of Maine. Before we turn to questions, I'd just like to provide a quick update on where we are with respect to vital medical assets across the state. In total, there are 314 ICU beds available, uh, uh, 314 ICU beds, period. Of those, 147 are available. There are 344 total ventilators. Of those, 304 are available. There are also 240 alternative ventilators that are 100% available. One note is that going forward, Maine CDC will be combining our reporting of regular ventilators and alternative ventilators into one number. This is pursuant to a change in the way the federal government is tracking these as well. 
So again, going forward, I'll just be reporting that one singular number of all ventilators and then the number that are available. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. And we'll turn things now over to questions from our colleagues from the media. And today's question, or today's first question goes to Kevin Miller from the Portland Press Herald. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, thank you, Dr. Shaw and Governor, uh, Governor Mills for squeezing this in today uh, amid everything else. Um, one, just a clarifying question about, about the deaths. Um, can you just make sure I understand the new deaths that happened at, can you break down the deaths that happened at the long-term care facilities and then kind of more broadly expanding on that, you mentioned that the state is going to be doing more searching for cases, the way you put it, more searching for cases at these uh, long-term care facilities. You know, it's hard not to see what's happening in other states, you know, 45 deaths at one facility in Virginia, um, you know, a couple dozen at a veteran's home in Massachusetts. Can you just talk about what that means and, and what you've learned from other states that are being lessons that are being incorporated here in Maine? Certainly, Kevin. Uh, so Kevin's first question is around clarifying the number of individuals who have passed at the long-term care facilities that I've mentioned. And, and Kevin, there have been two individuals who have passed at each of the facilities, Maine Vets, Tall Pines, and Augusta Rehab. Uh, so for a total of six individuals at those facilities overall. Uh, and what we've learned from the experience of working with long-term care facilities and seeing the experience in other states has really informed our approach here. For example, the stance that we've taken to look as actively as possible for cases is informed by earlier experience in, experiences in other states where the complete picture was not known. Uh, and so even today, right now, a lot of other states are trying to figure out whether to engage in what we call active case finding. A lot of other states are trying to figure out whether to engage in it whereas we in Maine have been already doing it for a while, and we're just now refining the nuances of our model. But I think the important point there, Kevin, is that as we know in public health, when you look for things, you go out, when, when you go out and search for things, you do find them. And so we do anticipate finding additional cases in long-term care facilities, whether that's the ones we're already aware of or others that are out there. That's not a sign that anything has gone astray. It's not a sign that anything has gone awry. It's a sign that we want to know what's out there so that we can provide the best available evidence and public health guidance to keep our friends, our spouses, our parents who live in these facilities safe. But Kevin, we've learned a lot and we're continuing to learn a lot. And as new papers are published, as new data come out, we adjust course, that's the scientific method. Uh, I will turn next to Kara Bracken from WGME. Kara from WGME. Right. Kara, we'll check back in with you uh, after we turn next to Don Kerrigan from News Center. Go ahead, Don. Don? Hi, good, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Shah and Governor Mills. A question again about the, these long-term care cases. Uh, do we know how, what the, the original sources were of infection in those facilities? And how much concern is there on part-time staff? We know there are part-time staffers in a number of these facilities that may work in several facilities. How can much concern is there of cases being brought in and transferred around that way. Uh, so Don's question is around what the source of any possible infection might be, whether it's in a long-term care facility or frankly, any healthcare facility. And Don, uh, this is one of the things that our disease detectives try to sort out as they investigate each and every one of these outbreaks. They try to construct a timeline of who got sick and when and A, they try to determine whether it could have been brought in by a resident who may have, say, temporarily been visiting family members uh, who may have been ill or whether it was from a staff member. Given how large many of these facilities are 
and the fact that many of these facilities are located in counties where there is already community transmission. It becomes increasingly difficult to really pin down what the first case was and where that person uh, may have acquired it, especially so in, case, in counties like York, Cumberland, and Penobscot, where community transmission is occurring, which means it's all around us. So, Don, you asked specifically about part-time workers or workers who may circulate between or among facilities. There is unfortunately a risk in that situation that someone who is ill could amplify the spread. That's a risk. One of the reasons why over a month ago, Maine CDC put out guidance through a health alert to all such long-term care facilities. One of the reasons we did that was in recognition of this possibility. And we asked long-term care facilities at that time to take a look at employees of that sort and make sure, for example, they were getting their symptoms checked before they walked in the building to see if they were running a fever, to make sure that if they had any other symptoms of coronavirus, they weren't bringing it in. And that's something that we did actually starting back on March, I think March 9th was our first such notice, and even informally in the weeks even before that. So Don, we're certainly concerned about that. It, it, it is a risk, but it's one that we've seen coming down the pike starting five or six weeks ago. Um, I'd like to turn back to Kara Bracken from WGME. Kara, go ahead. Hi, this is Kara from WGME. I do have a question for Governor Mills. Sure. Okay, so tomorrow, Governor Mills, what do you hope to hear in tomorrow's call from the president and all the governors that might help you decide whether to relax restrictions or keep them in place? What do I hope to hear on the, on the president's call? Uh, We've had eight of those calls. <clears throat> um, generally speaking, it's the governors expressing uh, the need to uh, keep our people safe, the need to uh, have cooperation from the federal government. And I imagine we'll be talking about our budgets uh, and the need for uh, distribution of the CARES Act relief package, that kind of thing. I have no idea what's on the president's agenda. I can't speak for him. Okay, thank you. Then I do have one for Dr. Shaw. Uh, go ahead, Kara. All right, so given the high stress and emotionally draining work and experiences that those on the front lines especially are dealing with during the COVID-19 crisis, what kind of mental health statewide plans might be developing or on the horizon? Mental health statewide plans. Go ahead, Governor. <laughs> That's a good question for Commissioner Lambrew or she here, but we have been discussing that. Uh, and we are talking about um, implementing different reimbursement schemes for uh, programs for mental health providers and that kind of thing. And we know that there are calls coming into 211 and some of the TV uh, ads have been up there uh, seek, offering help for people with um, behavioral and mental health issues. Um, I can address that more per perhaps tomorrow or at a later time um, and let you uh, listen to Commissioner Lambrew on that as well. She's deeply involved in it. Thank you. Uh, Kara, I, I will just say as a reminder for any healthcare professional out there, we talk a lot about everybody making sure they take care of their mental and physical health. Healthcare providers are no different. These are difficult times, and it's just as important for healthcare providers to take care of themselves physically as well as mentally. As the governor said, we'll have more to talk about that in the very near future. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Steve Betts from the Courier Gazette. Go ahead, Steve. Yes, thank you. This is a question for Governor Mills. Sure. There was a study released last week from Oxford Economics that concluded that Maine would be the most vulnerable state, vulnerable state in the country to economic shocks from the pandemic. And this one, did, has your administration come up with any projections on what will happen in terms of state revenues, and therefore how much money can be given out in state education aid and revenue, revenue sharing? A good question, Steve. I'm not familiar, did you say Oxford study? Oxford Economics? Oxford Economics. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I have not read that study, but every day we're talking about the status of revenues, state revenues and local revenues. Uh, the highway fund uh, has been hit, obviously. We're talking to members of Congress about what could be included in the fourth tranche of congressional assistance, hoping that um, 
the Treasury Secretary will loosen up the guidelines for the use of the money from the third tranche, the CARES Act, so that we can help uh, keep our budget um, at a healthy level, including money that goes through the state to, for uh, GPA, for education, K through 12 education. And there's a separate bunch of, separate um, group of funds for higher ed uh, from the federal government. Uh, and we're keeping close tabs on all of that. In terms of long-term long -term economics, I'm speaking in an ad hoc fashion with a great number of people, and Heather Johnson is as well, with members of the business community, the labor community, people with uh, nationally known um, credentials, uh, economists and financial experts uh, to determine how and when we might be able to revive the economy in different sectors. It's a long-term thing. It's a work in progress. Uh, not able to give you a succinct plan because, again, the economic plan is tied in with the plan to defeat the virus. That is first and foremost. We don't take significant steps towards reviving the economy until we defeat the, the virus because without healthy people, you can't have a healthy economy. Great. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Go ahead, Amy. Amy Brown, WERU, go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have a couple of questions that I believe are for Governor Mills. They're from our listeners. The first is, what rights do tenants have when their landlords are trying to sell their building or want to bring in people to take photos or show the apartment? And then also we've heard from someone who works with domestic violence agencies across the state who says they have concerns that the stay-at-home order may have people feeling as if they can't leave an unsafe situation abusers may be taking advantage of that and they've asked if the governor can reassure people that that's not the case Boy, that they yeah. can leave for yeah. safety issues and also maybe speak to what's being done to help support for people who are trapped in those situations right now oh absolutely that's a great question a great observation and we've been talking with francine stark and others from the coalition to end domestic violence and they put a great, they had a great op-ed just last week in the newspaper reassuring people that help is available. The 1-800 number, and I hope you put it up on your station, uh, is always there. There is help around the clock. The shelters are active around the state, and they're taking people in and families in who need to escape violence. That is always first and foremost on our minds, how to keep people safe. With your question, when it comes to your question about tenants' rights, um, I can't give you legal advice about what particular tenants can do when a particular landlord may want to show the property. That's a matter of contract right. But we are working uh, on something that I will be able to announce tomorrow with respect to evictions and the rights of tenants in general. And uh, as I mentioned before, I've been speaking with landlords and with tenant organizations and with Pine Tree Legal, with bankers and credit union people about what they can and what they are doing, what they can do um, to mitigate the effects of the virus on our economy. We, wanna, we want to reduce homelessness, first and foremost, keep people off the streets. When we have a stay-at-home order, it sort of assumes people have a home to go to. And that's where landlords and bankers and credit unions, lenders can come in, uh, come into play and help. And I'll have more to say about that tomorrow. Thanks, Amy. I'd like to turn next to Steve Missler from Maine Public. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks for taking the call, uh, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills. This question is um, for both of you, and it's really about testing. It, I mean, since we've our first confirmed case more than a month ago, it, it seems as though CDC has been trying to manage this outbreak with a very limited testing capacity, which has kind of given us a, an incomplete picture of the of the outbreak in Maine. And I'm guess, and I'm guessing you're not still where you want to be in terms of capacity. Yet from what I've read, widespread testing along with antibody testing is a key component to being able to slowly reopen the economy whenever we decide to do that, um, and perhaps relaxing some restrictions on gatherings. If that's true, what do you estimate Maine will need in terms of diagnostic testing and or antibody testing capacity, and when do you think that might be available? 
I'm not an anti I'm not an expert on the antibody testing, but I understand that's still being tested itself and is not a sure thing yet. Uh, it would be lovely if we all had that and if it were approved and medically um, appropriate. If it works, fine, let's get it. It'll be one thing I'm sure we'll discuss on the call with the president tomorrow because he's been talking about that as well. Mm -hmm. On the other tests, uh, Dr. Shaw can r relate what we have capacity for right now. You know that some other states have gotten um, a greater number of tests uh, in their states. That's because they are now hot spots. We have, I've made the case several times to the president and the vice president that we also need greater testing capacity because we don't want to become a hot spot. If you give those to us now, let us acquire those now from all whatever appropriate sources, we can, we can break the curve before it becomes a surge. Thank you, Governor. And Steve, in addition, um, although I, I haven't seen the numbers for a few days, the last time we ran the numbers, Maine was in the higher quartile of states that, ha in terms of per capita testing. Uh, I believe the last time I took a look at the numbers, we were 14th, uh, 13th or 14th in the, in the nation in terms of the per capita number of tests being done. But as you note, additional testing is needed. Uh, it's needed so that the public health apparatus can identify those folks, make contact with them, and then uh, talk about the quarantine and isolation measures that we've talked about previously. But overall, there are three types of testing. There's the testing that's done at our laboratory and at other commercial laboratories. That's the RNA, DNA-based test. Our lab right now has the capacity to perform about 3,000 of those. The second type is the rapid or point of care testing. As, as you're aware, Maine recently received 15 such machines from Abbott, as well as a number of test kits, although the number that we got was not what we were initially told we would get, we've actually received a donation of now 10 additional test kits from Martins Point Healthcare, effectively double, tripling what we were originally given uh, by the federal government. We've started deploying those to high-risk sites to make sure that individuals who we are especially concerned about can get testing. And then on the antibody piece, antibody testing is something that there's a lot of research and development on. There, uh, the FDA has been trying to approve those as quickly as possible, but there have been some warning lights that have been flashed even just today by the National Academy of Science, making sure that any test that gets adopted for widespread use, making sure that it passes scientific muster. So much more to come on the testing front there, Steve. Uh, can I, can I just quick, quickly follow up with the governor? I just, I just want to, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is how much of a consideration is testing capacity in, when you're talking about reopening the economy? Like how much of that do you think you need in order to pull the trigger on, either, whether it's slowly or quickly reopening the main economy? Well, it's a significant factor in how and when and how quickly we o reopen different sectors and different parts of the economy. Um, and it depends on how the tests are employed. Right now, obviously, we're focusing on long-term care facilities and nursing homes and health care workers and first responders. Those are still high-priority people uh, for testing. Um, we, we'll never have enough to test everybody in the state of Maine, and even if we did, how long how long is a negative test good for? <laughs> you might be negative today and positive next week. So the best preparation for reopening the economy is to continue doing what we're all doing, what everybody in the state of Maine is doing right now, and that is staying home, staying apart. I think we are being successful. I really feel like we're doing good work here, and Dr. Hey. Shaw's people are doing great work tracing, contact tracing, uh, and keeping the numbers, uh, keeping top, uh, on top of the numbers. But there's more to be done, and we've got to stay the course. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And uh, final question today goes to Jessica Piper from the BDN. Go ahead, Jessica. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, thanks for being here this afternoon. I was wondering on the outbreaks in long-term care facilities, I was wondering if you could provide a breakdown of residents versus staff in terms of the positive tests. 
And sure. then also I was wondering, when residents or staff in those facilities test negative, do you have plans to you know, test them again given the incubation period, um, or what's going on with that? Sure. Um, so just uh, for all of the facilities that we are working on right now, uh, that is Maine Vets, Augusta Rehab, Tall Pines, and Cedars, uh, if we were to roll up all of those individuals, those people there, both residents and staff, that amounts to 94 residents and 43 staff who have tested positive for a total of 137 out of our 770 cases that are accounted for by long-term care facilities, both residents or staff. And so that is 17.8% um, uh, or so. So that's kind of the fraction uh, of what we're looking at related to long-term care facilities. Now, with respect to retesting, uh, that's something that's under discussion, something that we've actually been talking with the US CDC about, because as you can imagine, there's not really a model in place to help us think about how we should go about this. We're one of the first states that have been in the vanguard in this regard, looking at universal testing in long-term care facilities. As I've talked about, when you, when you engage in universal testing, and as the governor noted, you generate an immediate question of whether and when to retest individuals who are negative. On one hand, it seems like a logical thing to do. Question, of course, is when. But on the other hand, the question might be, what would it change on top of the public health advice that's already being given to these facilities to reduce communal interactions, for healthcare workers to be wearing PPE? So we have to balance those two things and make sure we're making a decision that's smart and gives us information that's both new and that might change the course of what we're already doing. So it's definitely something we're thinking about. We've been talking with the US CDC about it. And because of how quickly and proactively we've acted, we're generating new questions that really not, not many people have ever thought about. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons I'm so delighted to have the team at Maine CDC and across the administration that we do, because we're a team of, of experts that can think these things through in a thoughtful manner. That was the last question. Governor, over to you. Thank you. Just let me conclude um, the same way I started, thanking the people of Maine, as always. Um, today, I do believe in miracles. I hope you do, too. The last seven days have been a test, a trial of our patience, our courage, our resiliency. And we've stayed the course. You have stayed the course. And the best course of action, again, be kind to one another. Hug your kids. Have courage. Be patient. Stay the course. Do your part. Stay apart. Thank you for all you're doing to help us all stay safe and healthy.